Well, thank you, Paige, and hello. Thank you for inviting us into your office or home today. During our time together, we're going to help you manage the higher expectations that are on your shoulders to prevent expensive and potentially unsafe deferred maintenance. Well, we heard from you that the majority of you are gearing up for improved reserve strategy this coming year, and we're going to help you do that by helping you know how to make wise decisions about reserve funding and spending. At the end of today's program, we're even going to show you a new tool that we've developed free to all of our professional reserve study clients that's going to help you through the budget process. Well, while 2020 surprised us with the upheaval over COVID-19, our industry has taken yet another turn here in 2021. The tragic collapse of Champlain Tower South on July 24 got our attention because it was so deadly and so unexpected. Um, what this means is now our concerns for deferred maintenance have expanded beyond projects that cause catch-up special assessments or even unsightly things that can drop property values. Now we need to consider that deferred maintenance can also be a safety issue. It can be dangerous. And that's why following a roadmap to the future is even more important, something that guides us forward so our present is less stressful and our future is more secure. What we found out this year is that it took us a quick two steps forward through time from an environment where reserves are understood to be a good idea, a nice thing for associations to have when they have some extra money, and we skipped right through reserves being important, understanding their connection to avoiding unfair and unsettling special assessments, and these times have brought us right to reserves being critical to the future of the association where it sustains the property and keeps all the owners and residents safe. Our strategy for today to help you make better daily and weekly reserve decisions and to set you up for success in 2022 is to start out with a big picture perspective. And we do this to give you the tools so you can execute a successful strategy for your association. As Jim and I walk you through today's material, we're going to periodically ask you to raise your hands to let us know if you're staying on track, keeping up with the concepts that we're laying out. So let's practice that to raise your hands idea. So grab your mouse and click the hands raise icon that you see on your control panel, similar to the one you see on screen. And that'll let us know that you're ready to get going on today's presentation. So hands up, please. I say that like I'm a bank robber. Um, Hands up to let us know you're ready to go. Very nice. Okay, Jim, they're with us. So thank you all. You can put your hands down and let's get going. This is our roadmap for today's presentation, starting with a little introductory time to brush up your basic reserve funding and spending concepts, sharpen you up for the road ahead. So Jim, uh, start us off with perhaps the most important concept we have to share, communicating the purpose of reserve contributions to boards, to owners, to everyone at the association so everyone can get on the same page. What's this big, important concept? Yeah, thank you, Robert. First of all, it's great to be joining you today. And for sure, having the right tools and strategies is going to set you up for reserve fund success. So let's start at the top with this key question. What are the contributions to reserves for? Are they for the here and now? Or are they for future projects? Take a minute to think about this. For the here and now or for the future projects? Re reserve contributions are for the present ongoing deterioration at the property. They're not for the future. It's not a slush fund or a rainy day fund. Think carefully about this. Each owner benefits daily from the function, whether those assets are new, at the midpoint of life, or they're aged. And that deterioration should be viewed as real as any other bill of the association. That's a fundamental concept that we need you to understand right here at the start today. You're going to have a lot more success with your reserves when you always talk about contributions in the present tense. It's every owner's responsibility to offset deterioration during the time they own a home in the association. They're not setting aside funds for the future. 
Another basic concept is the four reserve rules. Deterioration and the cost to repair and replace are inevitable. Ignoring the cost of deterioration doesn't change that reality. And it's the board who's responsible to protect, maintain, and enhance the assets of the association. If the board delays a project and deferred maintenance sets in, those same expenses will only increase. And finally, homeowners always get stuck paying the bills and those delays only end up costing them more money. So keep it simple with these four concepts. Keep the board focused on the target. It is their duty, again, to protect, maintain, and enhance the assets of the association and to run the business of the association in a financially sound and sustainable manner. And that means no guesswork. The goal is to have collected enough funds along the way to perform your projects when they're needed. Guessing or ignoring that reality of deterioration isn't going to get you prepared. So today we're going to lay out a roadmap for you and provide some key talking and decision points for you. Well, thanks, Jim. I want to lay a little more groundwork for board decision making, specifically how to safely make those decisions. Now, to minimize board liability risk, board decisions need to have three elements that come from the business judgment rule. Boards are going to enjoy protection from liability if meeting minutes demonstrate that they acted with a duty of care, which means good faith, um, making quality decisions, a duty of loyalty, which means putting the interests of the association above their own interests as homeowners. And then finally, a duty of inquiry, which means reaching out for information when you don't know the answer. We're not expecting you as board members to know all the answers. So this is what Jim said just a moment ago, no guessing. And that's where we fit in. A reserve study recommends the size of reserve contributions necessary to offset ongoing deterioration. So every year we help boards answer that important question, what do I do now? So Jim, let's um, move on to the next topic. What are some good talking points our guests today need to know when asked why an association should get, update or refer to their reserve study? Yeah, a current reserve study helps the association avoid surprises and it reduces costs um, reduces board liability, maximizes property values due to the property and the financial house being maintained and in order. And uh, it also keeps the association in some states in compliance with the law. There are a number of states that require reserve studies. And one more thing, there's the intangible benefit of keeping the owners informed, communicating with them so everyone understands where their monthly assessments are going and what that sometimes large reserve balance is there for. So ongoing yeah. communication. Money is yeah, that big deal. You don't, I just want to slow down and have you say that over <laughs> again. Communicating yeah. with the homeowners and making sure everyone understands what's going on. Right. You know, we have clients all different sizes and shapes. Um, some of them really scraping pennies. And we have some, some associations that are affluent. And nobody likes financial surprises. That's consistent across the board. So ongoing communication and transparency are vital to your success. And on the other hand, the consequences of going without a reserve study is regular surprises, increased expenses, and we'll touch on that a little bit more later, and higher board liability exposure, and the Ds, which we're going to show you on screen in a moment. And in, in my years, 24 years of doing this, money has been at the center of most problems with community associations, so this is important stuff. So the Ds, as you see on screen, are some things that are consequences of not having a study and not having your house in order. Disappointment, how the property looks. Um, discouragement, when the association doesn't have money, what it needs to do. Dysfunction, uh, which leads to homeowner discontent uh, and frustration. Deterioration, because there's no money or no action. Declining home values, poor curb appeal, rumors of special assessments. Uh, poor reputation in the real estate community, distrust, owners aware that the board's not taking care of the property, and sometimes, like we referred to and unfortunately learned this last year, danger and uh, life safety issue potential when deferred maintenance accumulates. Thanks, Jim. That's a, a great refresher of the big picture, and uh, it's sobering to think of the consequences. It used to be just trying to avoid a special assessment, and now we realize the consequences are so much bigger than we had ever anticipated. 
Well, now let's move ahead and talk about the application of these roadmap principles. In this section of application, we're gonna start by actually completely skipping talking about laws in the many states, 25 or so, that guide reserve studies or reserve disclosures. And that's because an association doesn't do reserve planning because of the law. Associations do reserve planning simply to prepare for their own projects. Do that and legal compliance is gonna follow. So, okay, let's talk about boards now. The managers are the agent for the board. So how do those two work effectively together as a team? The board makes decisions, but how are the managers with us today effectively encourage or coach the board towards making wise choices? Yeah, we on this webinar, we all likely know the theory that boards are responsible to run the association successfully, responsibly, and in a financially sustainable manner. But the reality is they all too often act like their job is to keep assessments low. Let's test that hands raised button and see if this uh, rings a bell with you and sounds like some boards that you know. You with me? <laughs> They're going up so quick. Are you seeing I'm the list? I'm going up fast. I can't <laughs> yeah. see the list, but I'm imagining. Yeah. Uh, so when, I, I wish the stock market went up that fast. Okay. Yeah. They, <laughs> yeah. Thank you. When board, so when boards are pursuing this wrong goal of keeping assessments low, they're acting more like self-interested homeowners, not acting in the best interests of the association like their business judgment rule duty of loyalty requires. So we need to continually remind boards of their job and their legal duty, helping them to keep their eye on the ball. And the interesting thing is that doing the right thing is actually in their financial best interests. Let me show you how effective reserve planning, how effective reserve planning actually makes money for everyone in the association. In our 2017 study among comparable neighboring associations, we found that home prices on a dollar per square foot basis were 12.6% higher in associations with well-funded reserves, those above 70% funded. This means a strong reserve fund boosts home values. Along with that, they were generally maintained better and the bottom line resulted in a much higher return on their investment. So just a few more dollars per month in reserve contributions and monthly assessments maximizes curb appeal and readiness and returns thousands of dollars to each owner in maximized home values. It's probably what you suspected, but now we have proof. And in a former life, I was an appraiser and uh, I always kind of knew this and, and knew the data was there and uh, this points to it. Yeah, so, curb appeal uh, is real. and It's very real, yeah. This makes a difference. And the people who are complaining about another 10 or 20 or 30 bucks a month are missing the point that this returns thousands of dollars in home values. Yeah. And the markets that require reserve studies, such as the, the states uh, that we operate in mostly, uh, the market understands this and they routinely ask for reserve studies when they compare properties. Yep. So a roadmap for success starts with the strategy of focusing on a simple message of responsibly budgeting so reserves offset ongoing deterioration. Again, not for the future or a rainy day. And that's a successful strategy that pays off with maximized home values. Great message to deliver. So let's take a moment now to be sure we understand some fundamental keywords relating to reserve studies and what goes into the studies. First, what we're about to share are not just association reserves ideas or concepts. These come from national reserve study standards, which were implemented back in 1998. Make sure your boards understand there are three types of reserve studies, a full reserve study, and then two different update products, a with site visit update or a no site visit update. Pretty simple. A, a full reserve, reserve study needs to be typically only done once and that's at the beginning point where everything is quantified, governing documents are reviewed, and uh, a lot more time involved in those. The vast majority of reserve studies performed in the U.S. then are the less expensive with site and no site visit updates. Most with site visit updates are done every few years, uh, influenced in some places by state laws. Uh, the no site visits are done in the in-between years. Remember, update products are much less expensive than that first full reserve study engagement. So you just need to get started. Yeah, you just need to get started. Lots of application there, Jim. 
Well, now let's get to some examples so our audience can make good decisions all throughout the year. And let's start with one of the most common. Is it a reserve expense or an operating expense? Jim, why don't you address that question? Yeah, we cover that question. We have an entire webinar on that, Reserve Studies 101, which you can find on our website, reservestudy.com or on YouTube. But let me summarize that in the next few slides. Think about it like this. There's a four-part test within those national standards that every reserve component must pass. Um, number one, is it a common area responsibility, not individual owner? It's a common area association responsibility. Number two, um, it has a limited useful life. Number three, it has a predictable remaining life. And four, it's above a minimum threshold cost of significance. Every component in your reserve study needs to pass this four-part test. In the state that I uh, live in, uh, there's a, it's codified that reserve study providers must consider expenses 1% or more of your annual total annual operating expenses. But let, let's get back to the question that you face on a regular basis. How do you know if something is a re reserve expense or an operating expense? First, look to your reserve study. If it's listed, it's a reserve expense and funded for. It's a reserve expense. Well, when you say the project, are you talking about the asset or the project? Or can you um, just spend a moment clarifying that? Right. Let's just say, for example, if it's a roof replacement component, in the study, just cleaning the gutters on the roof doesn't make that a reserve project. Uh, that's normal maintenance best addressed in the operating budget. Or many times in the reserve study, you'll see a full paint job of the of the uh, property. And then in the operating budget, maybe there's an annual touch up or maintenance. So those are separate. Got it. Yeah. So next, consider if it's related to that component really reaching its full remaining useful life. That means, for instance, a minor service call to a boiler is not a reserve project, but replacing the igniter system that may extend the boiler's remaining useful life by a number of years, that's a legitimate reserve expense. And then finally, if it truly looks like the component was missed and not included in the study or wasn't knowable, maybe it was part of a hidden system, um, then check with your reserve study provider to help answer that question and um, prevent you from guessing. So that's a good example of exercise in your duty of inquiry from the business judgment rule. These are dynamic documents that uh, change every year from year to year, not only the costs and the timing um, based on how things are wearing over time and, and uh, new information. And so it's a constant moving, moving target. Yeah, nothing wrong with reaching out to your reserve state provider and asking for clarification. Yeah, we're happy to help. That's what we're here for. So, Let's take a look at a simple, typical reserve component list. Um, it's got a description, useful life, that's UL, RUL, remaining useful life, and current current cost. So let's suppose your pool heater fails. You see in this list a pool resurface component, but no pool heater component. So from what you just learned, replacing the pool heater isn't automatically a reserve expense just because it's related to the pool. Check with your reserve study provider. There may be a reason it was excluded, or they may support the expenditure from reserves and add it to your component list in the next update. It's in your best interest not to guess. Too many properties gradually deplete their reserves by spending it on non-reserves projects. Okay, great. Um, that helps properties not deplete their reserves. You talked about uh, losing money by spending it inappropriately. Now. Is there something that managers and boards can do to help their properties actually save money, get prepared for the future? Yeah, I think understanding and guiding towards the best value for reserve dollars spent is uh, very, very important. Again, these are inevitable projects, and there is a sweet spot of value. When the remaining useful life is nearing zero, it's time to prepare or engage a professional to help you prepare a scope of work, bid documents, and help analyze those and make a decision for that best value. And the answer is often not the lowest bidder. Uh, approaching reserve spending this way effectively avoids much more expensive deferred maintenance related costs, um, but not all reserve projects are the same. So let's talk about this. Projects fail differently and can be prioritized differently. Some are okay to defer, some you really should do on schedule and proactively. And we suggest you further categorize your projects like you see on screen. 
Is this, uh, are the components we're looking at okay to defer as inconsequential? You know, when cash is tight, you can stop and perhaps not spend reserves if you choose and let that asset fail. You can live without it for a little while. Maybe it's discretionary. But we want to think twice about these projects that are labeled here reevaluate and obsolescence projects, doing the ones that have true merit for the association and ignoring the rest for now. And then it's the protection and catastrophic projects that you want to make sure to do on time. Any projects that are potential life safety issues and or protecting the building envelope, don't delay those. Those are the ones that'll get real expensive or cause hardships if you delay. The green categories here mean go, get them done. But just as a reminder, anything you defer, don't really, it doesn't really save the association any money. These projects are still going to need to be done. And you have to be careful deferring only the safe projects because otherwise you'll just cost the owners a bunch of extra money. Contact again, your, your reserve study provider if you have a question about this. Sounds like that's a recurring theme here today. Yeah. So let's move on and show you a photo of a, a classic example of a poor decision. Uh, here's a, a protection project that a board delayed um, doing their protective asphalt seal coat and repair cycle. Uh, looks to me like they waited quite a while. And as a consequence, the underlying structural pavement has failed. So now replacing that costs 10 to 20 times the cost of that seal project. So again, we got to find that sweet spot of value and maintain as you need. Um, the same is true for painting ironwork. Here, clearly, too late. Too late for a paint shop to yep. take care of it. Or replacing a roof. It's, uh, it's a bad idea to delay these protection or catastrophic projects unless you have an expert that's been engaged and is advised that it's okay. Everybody with me on this, understanding that reserve projects are different, give me a hands raised if you understand that some may be okay to delay and some should be done in a timely manner. What's a good example of a inconsequential? We're talking about maybe something like a, the water heater out in the rec room or something like right. that? that sure, new, new carpet in the rec room, a water heater. Um, those would be inconse inconsequential projects, right. I would think. Okay, thank you everyone. Very good. Thanks for being there with us. Okay, well, um, that's actually a, a real significant uh, learning point there to understand that reserve projects are different and you can uh, prioritize them to inconsequential all the way to the significant ones. That, um, but um, now that you know there's five types of failures, what about when the project matches, but the cost doesn't? What um, is a board or a manager supposed to do in that situation? Well, assuming you've diligently planned and um, given this kind of prioritization that we just talked about, make sure you go ahead and do the project. Expect that those extra dollars will either come from other reserve projects or be redistributed to other projects. Um, the asterisk here is to let you know this all happens automatically when you use the cash flow method, and uh, Robert will talk about that later. Um, then make sure your reserve study is updated with this new, informa new information, making your reserve study better each time and tracking actual decisions and uh, as well as costs and other economic factors. So don't spend a lot of time worrying about it. Spend the reserves as you need them to get the projects done, um, particularly those that protect the property. Remember the four reserve rules. Delayed projects often get expensive, and that just makes things expensive for the homeowners. Okay, well, when you get uh, to a decision point where you need to replace something, is it ever okay to upgrade a component, or are you forced to replace like with like? Yeah, you shouldn't be re you shouldn't be re spending reserves um, adding new assets to the association where one previously didn't exist. That's the key. But if the asset needs to be replaced, sure, it's totally fine to do a, an upgrade that um, brings added value, is consistent with the technology of today. And uh, again, it's uh, you don't want to be adding new assets, but uh, um, that's that's the the cut point. So remember, if the asset or project exists, is the key distinction. Remember that reserves are there to offset ongoing deterioration of existing assets. So it's not a slush fund to be used to buy new things for the association. Give me a hands raised if this is a clear point. You got them. 
Okay, Jim, yeah, everyone's good. tracking you. Uh, thank you all, hands down. Good, thank you. So if your boards ever have a question on this issue, uh, we can point you to references in National Reserve Study Standards that cover this point. Fantastic, okay. Well, let's talk about uh, actual money in reserves. And the big question, do we have enough? Um, is ours big enough to do what we want to do? So just like with components, we devote an entire webinar to this issue. We call it Reserve Studies 102. It's all about the calculations. And you can, again, find that on our website or on YouTube. Yeah, good. And the major point from that webinar is to measure reserve fund size and strength by percent funded, not the cash balance. It's all relative. Um, we spoke earlier about Champlain Towers South in Florida, and they had about $700,000 in the reserve fund. And that sounds like a lot of money to you understand the magnitude of the types of repairs uh, that they were facing, and they were only about 7% funded. So remember that cost of deterioration is ongoing. Percent funded will reveal if the result of those contributions, the resulting reserve balance, have kept pace with ongoing deterioration over the years. Next, we're going to show you a chart that shows you why percent funded matters. Um, is you can predict them special assessments, most special assessments coming. You can see them coming years in advance when you track and look at this percent funded. Special assessments are common when the association is in the zero to 30 percent red zone on the left but they're rare in most of the yellow zone and very rare in the green zone. So pretty powerful information to know. And uh, this is great information um, for boards and owners. Uh, so give me a hands raised if you can see how percent funded reveals if an association is prepared or unprepared for their upcoming expenses. Got it, Jim, they're tracking very nicely. Perfect. Okay, thank you all, hands down. But uh, I imagine everyone here with us is thinking, well, what's it actually take to adequately fund reserves and offset ongoing deterioration? Isn't that going to be just a fortune? And the answer is often it's about 25% of total budget, kind of like we show on this pie chart. Yeah. And, and, and the question, why budgeted contributions instead of special assessments? Well, with budgeted contribution contributions, every owner pays their fair share of this steady ongoing deterioration over the time that they owned a home in the association. So the result is that the funds exist when they're needed. Having the funds on hand eliminates this costly deferred maintenance. And remember, the future takes care of itself when you take care of proper contributions on an ongoing, base, ongoing basis. Everyone paying their fair share. This is the magic of how you avoid unfair special assessments and this, these expensive deferred maintenance projects and maximize the unit values. Yeah, the big ticket uh, benefits. Right. So this is all part of your roadmap to success. Uh, choosing your words and discussion points carefully is how curb appeal and property values are maximized. That's a, that's a successful strategy. You're probably distracted thinking, some of you, that uh, your associations aren't close to putting 25% of your total budget aside, and you're wondering if that's even possible. But I'll tell you that contributions are not too expensive. Even 25% of total budget works out to about the cost of a premium cup of coffee per day. That's very affordable. And another fact is that budgeted contributions are the least expensive way to pay for reserve expenses. Uh, the expenses are what they are. The only choice you have is how the owners will pay. With budgeted contributions for a, let's get to the next slide, please, Robert. With budgeted contributions, as you'll see on this slide, as, as an example of a $250,000 $50, roof project, owner contributions factoring some compounded interest over the years you're reserving for that roof um, wind up costing less than that $250,000. And if you have to uh, do a special assessment, then that's 250000 on demand, plus the additional administrative costs and headaches and other things that come with a special assessment. And But at the current rates, it'll take you about $320,000 from the owners to pay back a $250,000 loan. So like we've said plenty of times before in this webinar, delaying usually gets more expensive. 
So actually what I hear you saying is the board members who have the courage to increase homeowner assessments to the amount that the reserves are being offset, that's actually the way they save the owners the most money because that way you're getting compound interest from the bank and the, not the opposite where you're paying interest to the bank with the loan. I, I, I get how that makes sense, but that requires c- courage and that requires um, a, a communication set of skills. Um, so let's now, let me ask you now, can you offer some help for manager, managers of associations and board members where they need to have the courage and where they need to look for some strategies? How do we increase our reserve contributions? How do we increase them enough? How do we get started on the path to success? Yeah, first of all, by you know just engaging a professional reserve study provider whose expertise is laying out uh, unobjectively these expenses, we're kind of a shield for that courage. Yes, it takes courage, but that's why you go to your professionals so that we can be your backstop and help you get there. One, one thing we've thought of over the years, we call the $10 solution. Um, it likely took most associations years or even decades to get into an underfunded jam. So generally, it's going to take a few years to get out, but have have them raise reserve contributions by $10 a month per owner this year, and then another $10 per month uh, the following year. And then you'll see in just a few years, it's usually all it takes for most associations to start making adequate reserve contributions. Now, I want to mention it. Um, I just want to mention it briefly because some people get all hung up on this. There are two different ways to calculate reserve contributions, straight line and cash flow methodologies. Both have their strengths and weaknesses, but the bottom line is that they both provide for exactly the same expenses. Um, if you or someone you know is curious uh, to dive into that in more detail, we address this in our webinar on funding plans. That's Reserve Studies 103, again, on our website, reservestudy.com or on YouTube. Fantastic, Jim. Well, we're at the summary time for our program today, still answering the question, what's the right thing to do? How do you have reserve fund success at your association? So uh, bring it to a close here, Jim, with some summary advice. Yeah, well, we're now in budget time of year for most associations, and so it's real timely to know what to look for in your study. Um, They're fairly large documents, and so start with the summary pages. The executive summary and cash flow summaries uh, are great places to look, and look for the key three results. Number one is the component list, what you're setting aside reserve, reserve funds for. We showed you a sample of that earlier. Number two, an evaluation of the reserve fund strength measured by percent funded. And number three, a multi-year funding plan. So after you've received the study, what do you distribute? We recommend the executive summary should go to all owners and leave the complete reserve study for those that specifically request it. And then you can either send them a digital copy or a link so they can read it or print it themselves. Yeah, no reason to cut down a lot of trees printing lots and lots and lots of reserve studies that most people are not going to read. Yeah. Yeah, that's been a nice change over the years is not sending out reams of paper. Yep. Um, and so what does a successful community look like? You know, it's peaceful and it's well run. The business is well run. So you, measure, you measure reserve success by lack of disruptive special assessments, projects getting done on time, percent funded above 70%, and that the reserves are spent only on true reserves projects and the ability to pay your operating fund projects are from the operating fund. Well, that's an amazing concept right there. (laughs) And so here's an inside pro tip about updating. Most associations come back to us for a with site visit update every three years or so. In uh, my home state of Washington, reserve studies um, updates are mandated every year with every third year being a site inspection. Um, Because reserve study information is in a constant state of change, we find that special assessments drop about 30% in the associations where they do the no site visit updates in their in-between cycle of the with site visit updates. That's a big drop and it's for a simple reason. They're keeping their eye on the ball and they're factoring actual costs and the current market. And that's been wildly fluctuating. Uh, Inflation is a very, very real thing to understand. It demonstrates their duty of inquiry and duty of care, getting the information they need to make quality decisions for the care of the property. 
Now, one more time, please give me a hands raised if you're ready for Robert to introduce a new tool to uh, help make your budget process and reserve questions better and easier this year. Well, thanks, Jim. It sounds like uh, or it looks like everyone's ready for that. Thank you for raising your hands. Let me show you a, a new tool that Jim was talking about. We call it UPlanet. For years, you received a completed reserve study and read it. A uh, long time ago, we would print it and put it in the mail. Lately, we've been creating a PDF and you've been accessing it online. But now in addition, we've created a tool we call Uplant that allows you to actually interact with your numbers. It's a live thing. You can test ideas, see what happens when you change a number here or there, print out different charts or tables that you can use in the budget planning process. We've loaded it with your information so it's like a live version of your reserve study. Uplant doesn't affect the reserve study. It's just a powerful online reserve calculator that allows you to see for yourself what happens when you don't do exactly what's laid out in the reserve study. It's like a little flight simulator program, able to test different things that you want might want to try to do. And the good news is access to Uplanet is free with every association reserves, full with site visit and no site, no site visit reserve study. For all other associations, it's available on a subscription basis for $149 per budget season. We do want you making informed decisions, giving you the tools you need to make informed choices, seeing for yourself what happens when you tweak some of the numbers and setting your association up for success. It's part of our goal that our clients have a good grasp on the physical and financial condition of their properties. We want to set you up with that roadmap and the tools you need to get towards an improved future. And that's the end of what we wanted to share with you today. I'll include a link in the webinar outline to more information on Uplanet and other topics we mentioned. Scroll down to the bottom of our homepage if you want to sign up to be notified of upcoming programs like this one, or click a link at the top of our homepage to request a proposal for your association and find out uh, how we can help you at your association. To get today's outline, fill out a short survey at the end of today's program here, just a moment after we're done with the Q&A, and tell us what you'd like to see in future programs. I think this is our fifth new program this year, and so we are um, creating a lot of new curriculum for our audience. So I'll turn the microphone over to Paige now, who will serve as our MC for our Q&A time together. <music>